Yesterday, I was the first to get out a story on the R5 8K on autofocus specs. After about 12 hours, my traffic started to drop off and, you know it, the other channels caught up and published their own information with their own unique spin. Some even had the good fortune of having the R5 as a prop like Gordon Lang. It's a good looking camera. But others offered insight and analysis. Delivering informative capability-based reviews and tutorials on camera gear, filming techniques, and content creation. It's Simon from The Ordinary Filmmaker. If you're new here, make sure you click that subscribe and like button as it really does help support my channel. And all the links to everything I talk about in this video are in the description down below. So yesterday, uh, this was right at midnight, I would just gotten an email uh, from one of my subscribers and he had told me that Australia had just released some information on the R5. So doing what a dedicated YouTuber would do, instead of sleeping, I got out of bed, got dressed, got prepped, came down here to my studio and I presented the 8K details and the autofocus details. And I was the first, nobody had known anything about this. It wasn't even on Canon Rumors. I thought, great, I probably got a good six or seven hours before the pros come along, so I've got all that time. And sure enough, after about 12 hours, everybody else started producing their videos. A lot of them kind of restated what I already had, so it wasn't a huge interest to me, but I came across Tony Northrop's uh, channel, across his video. And I really liked it because what I like about Tony is he just doesn't give you the information, he gives you his insight and analysis. And I really appreciate that. It's something that I believe very strongly in doing as well. But I disagreed with three fundamental things he was talking about. Well, more or less two. One thing is just a little bit annoying to me. Uh, one was IBIS. And I, and I, and I get this. Uh, Tony was saying that Canon's kind of using weasel words here, using the term new approach or the phrase new approach. And what bothers me is We've been kind of let down the garden path many times with Canon. Yes, they promise us something. Sure, we'll give it to you, but we're going to take this away. And that cripple hammer, um, it's, it's almost like this weight here. It's not a cripple hammer. It's a big, heavy weight that just comes smashing down and takes what would all, in all intents and purposes, be a very good camera and gives us something that's just disappointing. Um, I, I can look at the EOS R and the RP, and I was relatively disappointed with those cameras, I was expecting them to deliver us something that was comparable to what else was on the market from other companies, but they didn't. And Tony kind of stuck on this and said, you know, is it really going to be IBIS or are they going to use some sort of digital um, computational power type function to deliver the capability? And I thought about it for a little bit and, you know, from my point of view, if they're able to deliver the capability, I don't really care how it's done, whether it's in hardware or software, but if they can deliver stabilization, up to eight stops of stabilization, and we don't get any warping effects, well, that's the capability I'm looking for. I don't really too care about that. But what really kind of puzzled me, uh, or really got me, was Tony went back to, I think it was June 2018, and he was talking about how uh, Chelsea had mentioned that I, and I think it was partly done in a joking way, that they're holding back on technology and that they're banking their technology. They're looking at, they want to, and I can't remember how he exactly said this, it was more, innovation is very expensive. And if we sort of take a step back, let others innovate, and we can bank our tech, we can develop better, and then we can just come out and crash the market. It doesn't make sense to me. Companies do not hold back on tech. If they've got tech, they release it. At least companies don't do it on purpose. One case in point, I can think of a company where they held back on technology. It wasn't because, well, let me give you the example. Commodore in the late 80s and early 90s had the Amiga technology. They purchased Amiga Inc., which had this computer that was so much ahead of its time. It pioneered multimedia before multimedia was even a phrase. To give you an idea, um, in the mid 80s, if you want to do anything like video, anything like this, you'd be looking at least $100,000 in cost just to set up a basic studio. For $5,000, and this is in 1985 dollars, for $5,000, actually it was 1987 that they came out with it, the video toaster system, you could 
All that money you would have spent, that $100,000, you could now spend five or $6,000. So it changed everything. Just like Apple changed desktop publishing, the Amiga changed desktop video. But Commodore, Commodore USA at least, Commodore UK was much more strategic. Commodore USA, uh, I don't think they understood a strategy. I think it was all about Irving Gould trying to get as much money as he could from the Commodore experience. It, it was not about taking advantage of the technology and Commodore filed for bankruptcy in 1994. Canon in 2016 came up with their new strategic plan. It was 2016 to 2020. And one of the things they had talked about is hitting hard with research and development. Now, if you know anything about strategic planning, especially for a company the size of Canon, because Canon is a large imaging company, it's, they're not just doing one thing, which is cameras. To come up with a new strategic plan, it's not like you immediately turn that on and then, oh, six months later, you've got new cameras. You've got to take that strategic plan and you've got to operationalize it. You've got to make it tactical. And it can take a good couple of years before you start developing new technology and getting that to the street. And sure enough, in 2018, two years later, we had the new RF system. The lenses, we only had three of them at the time. They looked pretty good, but there wasn't enough there for us to really understand if it was good or not. But here we are in 2020. We can see from all the RF lenses that we have that there's really good technology here. It's not as though that Canon held back till 2020 and said, oh, by the way, here you go, here's 10 lenses. Oh, we're gonna give you another eight more and we're gonna give you three new mirrorless bodies. No, this stuff has been on the works for many years. Canon did take a step back. They did realize that innovation was costing them and they want to sit back and milk some of their technology. And I'll clearly say today, I'm still using Canon and one of the reasons I'm using Canon is one feature alone. It's not the quality of the video. I mean, look, I, this is not high detail video, but the autofocus, as Tony said in his video, he has six cameras, I just have the one, but I always leave it on autofocus. It's completely trustworthy and I respect that. And that really, really helps me as a single person running this channel, but that they're banking technology. Well, let's think about it. A CEO and his board of directors decides that, yeah, we're going to hold off on technology. We're going to take our dominant market share, which was about 50% at the time or higher, and we're going to let that slide. We're going to take losses. We're going to lose money so that in what, three or four years, we can hit back and kill our competition? That's not how business works. And if the board of, or the, the shareholders ever got wind of this, they'd be kicked out of the business. And who knows, you might even have some crimes that they're guilty of. So I had a problem with that. And, and I, look, I, I love Tony. I love his channel. I've learned a lot from him. And before I got started as a YouTuber, I learned quite a bit from Tony's videos where we talk about different technology and how things actually worked. And I think partly he was talking in jest about, at least in 2018, that they're holding back technology. But the way he kind of re-talked about it again, it kind of seemed like, it was more plausible, and I just don't buy that at all. And he had about three different scenarios talking about 8K and how they could make this work. The one that he mentioned, which I really had a problem with, I don't even know why he mentioned this, and he's probably expecting a lot of comments and feedback on this, and that's, well, they could use Motion JPEG again. Motion JPEG was a bad idea with the 1DX Mark II and the 5D Mark IV in 2016 when it came out. Yes, the quality was pretty good, but you just had these huge files that were hard to work with. Well, 8K has a lot more information than 4K. He cited the 1DX Mark II as an example as to why they might do this. Well, let me counter that argument by citing the 1DX Mark III, which has H.265 and H.265 is available for 4K. Why is Canon going to go back? And they're not. I think this is ridiculous. Using motion JPEG in the R5 is, is definitely not a scenario that's going to be used. It just doesn't make any sense. But the underlying problem that he pointed out, and Fro knows mentioned the same thing, how on earth are they going to dissipate the heat? Now, I wish I had my cell phone down here, um, but you've all got smartphones. Um, I have an iPhone. Uh, Samsung has iPhones. Uh, you, you've probably got one of those as well. But look at how thin they are. I think they're somewhere around five to eight millimeters thickness. Yet my iPhone's capable of 4K 60. It doesn't overheat. I don't even know if there's a time limit. Most of us, this is a bit of an aside here, most of us who shoot video, we don't really care. We're shooting clips. We're not shooting events. We're not looking for 30 minutes or more. It was only, on it was only once I get into YouTube 
that, yeah, I came into that 30 minute limit all the time. And I was constantly looking down at my watch or my recorder to make sure I didn't go over that. And once I got close, I'd have to go to the camera, stop recording and start recording again. But for most ordinary filmmakers, for most people out there, a record limit of 30 minutes isn't a problem. They probably won't even encounter it. Even eight minutes, you can probably get away with it. For seven years of filming for my own personal family, I, I only remember once where that record time was an issue. And that's when I was shooting fireworks, holding up the rest of the time, no more than two minutes at a time. So they could definitely change the record times. And that was one of the things he talked about. They could reduce it. I don't believe he was going to do what Sony did with, I think it was, he quoted the A6300 where they just let it crash all the time. So they've got a strategic plan. They went back to 2016. They, they came up with a new strategic plan for four years, what they considered part of their phase five. So they've been planning stuff for a while. What Canon's been doing has actually been planned. They haven't just been doing it off the cuff. And what I think makes sense, because we've all seen the R5. Look at it. Look how thin it is. There's no giant port on it like the S1H. It's a beautiful looking camera. And I know Fro knows, and a lot of you are thinking, well, how on earth can this do 8K without some stupid um, record limit? How can it do 8K on a body that size? Well, that's where I was talking about the thickness of these phones. Apple. It ha uses ARM-based technology, and so does Samsung. They're all using it. And the great thing about ARM architecture is it's low voltage, which means low heat, but it's also high performance. And when it's not doing a lot of heavy-duty work, it's not producing a lot of heat, not using a lot of energy, so it's very efficient. What I believe that Canon's done, and this makes sense from a strategic point of view, and also makes sense based on the evidence we've seen of the R5, this camera is going to be better architected so it doesn't have as much heat that it has to dissipate. I believe it's going to use some sort of ARM architecture. Canon itself has stated they're going to come out with a whole new uh, image architecture or a new image sensor just for these cameras. They realize the current ones will not work for them. And some of you in, your, in the comments have said, yeah, they're probably going to put two digits in this and two digit tens or um, 11s, whatever it's going to be called. But I think this is all about architecture. And, and I'm surprised Tony didn't even mention this. Tony's got a lot of IT background, as do I. I'm actually an enterprise architect in my day job. And the best way to solve business problems is to take a step back, look at the business architecture, look at your strategic plan, and then bring it down to the technology side. And that's the only thing I can think of that would make sense is they better architecture the technology so they don't have to deal with heat being so much of a problem. I'm willing to bet you guys a brand new R5 that there are record limits in 8K. But what are they? If they're two minutes, would that be sufficient? I think for a lot of people, that would work. I know it would work for me most of the time. Four minutes would be better. If they could do even six minutes, I think that would please most people. The other discussion I'm hearing, um, this is everywhere, including myself, well, how on earth our, let's assume everything is true. And Canon has come out and they said, look, we're doing 8K, we're doing it in all modes. And in all modes, we get autofocus. Um, <clears throat> it, it's got a lot of us scratching our heads and saying, how can this tiny little camera without any heat dissipation be able to do 8K, be able to do IBIS, do everything they say it's going to do, 4K 160, sorry, 4K 120. How are they going to be able to do all this? The next question is, how are they going to be able to do it for and what price? Now, what I've done is it's kind of like buying a house. When you look at buying a house, you ask the agent, how much is this? How much should I sell my house for? And the agent doesn't go through with a checklist going, well, you've got this size room here. You've got these many rooms. You've got this many bathrooms. No, what they do is they generally look at how many rooms you've got, how many bathrooms, how many square feet, and then they do a search in their database. Well, for other houses of this size and location, what did they sell for? And then they suggest a price based on that. So all I've done is I've looked at this R5 and I'm using the number. Look at the number here. So we have the 1DX. So a mirrorless version of that would be the R1. No, and there's no talk about, I've used the term R1 in just speculation that we are gonna see a mirrorless version of the 1DX. And I know what you're thinking. I'll get to that in just a second. Well, it, the R5 seems like a mirrorless version of the 1D. It's better. I'll get to that in a minute. 
but I just want to finish my thought here. So we've got the 7D, we've got the 6D, we've got the 5D. And what I really believe is that the R5 is going to match up to the 5D. Now with the 5D, we've got several cameras. We have the 5D Mark IV, we have the 5DS, we have the 5DSR. And what I believe is there's going to be a few cameras in that price bracket. The high megapixel camera is probably going to come in and around there. And so what did the 5D Mark IV sell for? Well, their initial price, I believe, was around $3,500 US. So I figured, well, at a starting point, they're not going to sell it for less than that. They're probably going to base it around $3,500 and maybe bump it up 10% as one of my um, viewers said. And that's very plausible. So I'm using past information to predict the price. Now, I believe Tony said it's going to be $6,000, 5999 Fro doesn't know what price it is. We just don't know. But I believe there's going to be an R1 because there's, there's an R5, there's talk of an R6. That leaves a top-level camera. So what could they do? Well, 8K could be limited to something like five minutes or something like that. And then the R1 is a bigger camera. It's architected differently, and it will support longer recording times in 8K. Thank you for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. All equipment used and notes are placed in the description box. Show more box or down arrow thingy next to the title on the mobile app.